Hi everyone and welcome back to Women vs Everything. This is a podcast about women's history and women who overcame adversity and oppression. Uh, I'm Jess, I'm here with my lovely co-host Grace. Hi everyone! Do you want to tell us a little bit about how this normally works and what we're doing today? Sure. Um, the format for this podcast is that one of us goes and researches a badass woman from history and the other one is just given the dates and the locations and the general themes of that woman's life. And the other person researches the themes, the country, the cultural movements that were going on at the time. And we sew it all together on air and hope it works and makes sense. And so far it has. Yeah, so far so good, I think. So we're, we're actually doing things slightly out of order right now. Um, so we, we've got a few episodes in the bag that we've recorded, but this one we're recording and we're going to release quickly because this is a very sort of timely episode that we wanted to do kind of in response to some of the things that are going on in the world right now. Yeah, so today is the 4th of March and we're going to do an episode about Ukraine because of gestures wildly and vaguely at current events yeah I think you know I've seen a lot of social media posts you know not criticizing the attention that Ukraine is getting but also saying you know but having dismissed other cultures and other countries that have been going through the same thing for years and I think that's a fair criticism and I think we can make a commitment to also cover those countries and cultures in our next few episodes yeah definitely they all deserve that kind of attention and that kind of focus Absolutely. I, I think that's a very fair bias to give to us right now. And let's just use this as a jumping off point, I think. Yeah. You know, without totally skipping the general chit chat section of our podcast, if my voice sounds weird, it's because I have COVID. Oh no. I know. You poor thing. <laughs> so, so 2021. Um, yeah. yeah. Except it's 2022 now. I know. Like, what the hell? <laughs> so last year and the year before what the fuck <laughs> i know you know if you're listening to this podcast maybe like you need to put some like plastic bags over your headphones or something to protect yourself from getting covid off me <laughs> <laughs> covid is now transmissible through your ear holes absolutely we've been saying this <laughs> But yeah, um, thank God for vaccines. I very clearly have um, Omicron and my vaccine is working super hard. And um, it's a bit trippy having spent the last two years very frightened of something and then to get it. But it's a completely different story. It's like I don't have to be so frightened now because, you know, triple vaxxed and it's mutated, you know. So, yeah, I feel really grateful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I have some friends that even just got Delta like last year and were so sick. You know? Yeah, when I had it right at the start of the pandemic, like way before there were vaccines or anything, it was I don't have any kind of underlying conditions that are that are relevant to COVID, but I was so sick. I was like sicker than I've ever been in my life. It's terrifying this thing. Yeah. I'm really glad that you've only got it mildly if you had to get it at all and that you're doing mostly okay. Yay, vaccines. Yeah. They work. Fingers crossed it continues. Yay, vaccines indeed. Oh my god. And yay for, you know, staying around and keeping safe long enough. I mean, it's it's all a little scary. I, I don't know quite what the levels of restriction are like over in Ireland right now, but here in the UK, you probably heard that our government have removed any kind of COVID restrictions whatsoever, even the obligation to isolate if you test positive. So that's going to be fun over the next few weeks, watching how that plays out. I think in practice, like, I mean, everyone I know has said that they will still isolate if they get it. And I think a lot of people will, but I'm also very aware that I live in a sort of progressive bubble a lot of the time so yeah. I'm sure there's also a lot of people out there who just won't and who will just go out and spread it which is terrifying yeah it is it is and it's also at the same time I'm like even though I have it quite mild I'm like oh I'm still too unwell to kind of leave the house so mm -hmm. I wonder if people's symptoms might <laughs> just in a weird uh Darwin Awards way prevent them from spreading it further <laughs> They'll stay home because they're sick rather than because they have to. Yeah, I well, hope so. And um, in Ireland, we still have a seven day isolation period, which is really depressing because like I normally only have like one social event a week or a fortnight sometimes. But um, this week I was oh. going to a burlesque event tonight. <laughs> and oh, that sucks. I know. And it's my mom's 60th as well tomorrow night. Oh, 
Oh no, that's awful. What day of isolation are you on now? Is this day, th day two, day three? I got my first symptoms on Monday. So this is day five. Yeah, you, you do the maths for okay. me. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're halfway through. Yeah. Look, more than halfway through. God, here's like the annoying thing when you have other conditions anyway. Monday, I just had like, like feeling in my throat I get when like, you know, I like, I know I'm going to get a bit of a virus or something. But also I have these pains down my legs and in my hips. But those are all the sites where I get chronic pain flare ups anyway. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit like, I don't know, maybe I did something that triggered a chronic pain flare up. But I did two antigen tests on Monday and they were negative. And then Tuesday, I woke up full of the joys of spring, perfectly healthy, like bounced into work. And it was only Wednesday when I woke up with like just classic flu symptoms. They were so classic flu that I was like, oh, yeah, I better get like some medicine on the way to my family this evening and I was like oh I better take an antigen before I go just in case and and then it was positive mm -hmm. you know so it's like I felt so well on Tuesday I didn't even bother doing an antigen test you know so yeah I guess I just want to say if you have symptoms one day and you feel better the next day still do the I think you call them lateral flow tests in England don't you yes we do and speaking of which for our UK friends and listeners the latest information I can find is that LFTs, the, the, the free ones, are going away at the beginning of April. But right now, every person can order a box of them every three days. So, like, stock up. Stock up now. We are My partner and I are ordering a box each every three days right now because they are going, they are going to go away and they're going to become expensive. I mean, I, the latest figure I've seen is that Boots are going to be selling them for, like, £7 a test. What? Oh, my God. Right. It's bonkers. It's absolutely sickening. So, um, so yeah, please. In this instance, do stockpile. Like, get your free tests, stock up, just get as many as you can before the beginning of April. Oh, God. But, you know, you've got to continue that tradition, that British tradition, Jess, of, like, not caring about human life. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> just never thought it would turn on, like, actual British people. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't, they don't care. They don't care how many of us get sick. They don't care how many of us die. They just, the whole idea that now these tests are being sold by corporations is just, uh, you can't, you can't see because this is an audio format, but I'm like double face palming right now. It's so bad. Anyway, so yeah, there we go. Pro tip for the UK listeners. Stock up. Yeah. In Ireland, we've not had them free, but they've not been that expensive either. Yeah. Still a shit show. I mean, both of us are in a better situation than Americans, so... yeah. This is true. This is definitely true. And, like, today's topic, God, it could be worse. Could you imagine going through all of this where people are still getting COVID and then having a world war on your doorstep as well? Oh, God. It's so horrific. I'm so, so scared for all those people. It's, it's really terrible. Shall we, uh, shall we get into the topic? Yeah, let's do it. So for today's format, we said, well, one of us tell the story of a current, still alive Ukrainian badass woman, and one of us tell a historical story. And going with our, our usual learning style and preferences, I've gone with someone who's very current, and Jess has gone with a historical figure. So I would really like to go first because I'm not sure I will stay awake this entire recording. <laughs> that is fair. Please go ahead. Okay, I would really like to tell the story of Ruslana. That's her stage name, who was born in 1973. She is a World Music Award winning Eurovision Song Contest winning artist, and she holds the title of the People's Artist of Ukraine. She's also a former MP serving in the Ukrainian Parliament. Oh, wow. Multi-talented. I mm -hmm. love it. UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador in Ukraine. Voted in the top 10 most influential women of 2013 in Forbes magazine. And she's won, like, fortune of different awards. International Women of Courage Award in 2014. She was nominated to receive the title Hero of Ukraine, which is amazing. Wow. Yeah. That is... I know. Yeah, amazing. She's great. So my sources were Wikipedia. I think I found her on, like, a general search for, like, famous Ukrainian women. Unfortunately, what came up a lot in that search was 
like dating sites that are covers for maybe like sex trafficking you know or like fetishization of eastern european women oh gosh yeah yeah sex trafficking of slavic countries you know like uh, and i really think that's something we need to revisit we have talked about that as an episode about that area in the past and i think it is something we need to revisit in another episode you know yeah definitely yeah because as we know with war misogyny any any forms of hate crime increase and there's opportunists who will take this time to increase those crimes and exploitation you know yeah and sexual violence as a weapon of war is such a horrendous and often like under talked about problem in these situations is so ubiquitous across i mean i think it's fair to say probably virtually every significant conflict ever yes absolutely it's been for as long as there's been war there's been sexual violence as a tool of war you know yeah yes my sources are uh wikipedia an irish times article by david mclaughlin a video of Ruslana herself from the 25th of february speaking to dw.com about the current war going on in ukraine Mm -hmm. so Ruslana was raised in the province called Lviv Oblast and from the age of four she was enrolled in an experimental musical school so her parents were musical themselves and they really encouraged this in her and then with that school she performed at a large concert in Drozba Stadium in 1989 and one of the headlining acts of that concert was Vasil Zinkovich and that was the current people's artist winner of Ukraine and that uh, Vassil noticed her talent and at the end of the concert Vassil asked Ruslana to come onto the stage and declared in front of an audience of 15,000 spectators remember this young singer your compatriot you will see she will definitely become a real star wow I know she finished secondary school and entered the Lviv Conservatory where she graduated as a classical pianist and symphonic orchestra conductor in 1995 she was a student of the most prominent Ukrainian composers and conductors, Mykola Kolesa, who is regarded as the father of the Ukrainian conducting school. And by 1999, she had several singles and albums under her belt. So meanwhile, in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed and Ukraine became the largest of the splinter countries with a population of 52 million. And it's like 1,200 kilometers east to west. It has a huge farming sector worth $20 billion. And there was all this optimism and it just seems like a great time to be alive with democracy moving east. Ukraine held their first election in 1991. Mm-hmm. And they called that the flowering of our soul. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. Yeah, that. beautiful. But at the time, they were mostly surrounded by countries with co- communist pasts. But by 2004, most of those countries had joined the EU. But in Ukraine, being pro-EU or pro-Russia had become a kind of dividing line in politics and dividing the country geographically somewhat in that a lot of the pro-Russia people were living on the further east side of Ukraine. You know, as an Irish person with Northern Ireland, this really rings familiar bells, to be honest. A lot of Irish people are really empathising with Ukraine's position in this because, you know, we, we've something... Oh, interesting. We've something similar with Northern Ireland, except, you know, that Northern Ireland was kind of kept... <laughs> so we have a similar situation where six counties on island are, you know, politically maybe not part of our country. You know, it's it's just always been... It's very familiar. Yeah. So Russia began to divide the country physically... So they annexed, I don't have a date for this, but they annexed Crimea from Ukraine, which is like, Crimea is like a peninsula. And then they took two more regions in East Ukraine. But in a recent poll, 60% of Ukrainians are pro-EU. So... Oh, wow, that's pretty high. Yes, exactly. So Russia, as such, are saying, you know, because the people in the East part of your country mostly align with our politics and beliefs, we are just going to gradually take over ownership of that area. Hmm. And that's escalated into what we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. So Putin is saying that Ukraine is ancient Russian soil, but 
as many countries who have been colonized know that is not the you know it's like actually if you go back before it was russian soil it was something else you know yeah so there's all this kind of like in the 90s between where like when she's at secondary school and training to be this musician and composer that's kind of what's going on in the background so in 2004 Ruslana was internally selected to represent Ukraine at the Eurovision Song Contest she's she was just like hot to win it from day dot and she performed her self-composed song Wild Dances and won it the song received points from all other participating countries in the semi-final and in the final Switzerland was the only country to not give any points to the song which is still a huge thing like it's it's out of all the songs that are in that contest that all but one of the countries thought it was worth being in the top 10 or 12. That's amazing. Yeah. Do we have a link to the song that we can share in the show notes? Is it on YouTube or something? Yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We will have a listen and we'll pop a link to that on our socials. Mm -hmm. The single Wild Dances stayed 97 weeks in various European charts. Wow. It was certified in, certified gold in Belgium, Sweden, Russia, Greece, Czech Republic and Slovakia. And in Belgium, it topped the singles charts at number one for 10 consecutive weeks. And it also got number one in Ukraine and Greece. The English language album, Wild Dances, to add to her talents, Ruslana, she's able to speak a lot of different languages, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So the English version of the album was released in 2004. She went to Las Vegas, where she got the World Music Award as best-selling Ukrainian artist. And she just won all these awards for her music. And then she also won the award for Sexiest Girl in Greece. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay then. <laughs> the most influential public person in Ukraine. And was the first foreigner to receive the award of the Federation of Journalists in Turkey. She's this true creative. Like it doesn't just stop at music for her. She's also looking at ways to incorporate this creativity into everything. So she started a project called Wild Energy. Which was based on the science fiction novel by Marina and Serge Diachenko. And that's a novel called Wild Energy Lana. And it's based in a future city which experiences a global energy crisis. And it's kind of about how people overcome that crisis and kind of a, a story about the energy of the heart. And Lana, who the story is about, is uh, she's a synthetic inhabitant and she goes out to find like a mystical energy source. And it's amazing. So Wild Energy, Rosalana's project is like art, music, video, literature, social commitment, you know, and it's, it's kind of um, activism through creativity. Yeah, I mean, so so many talents and so many areas that she's working in. That's amazing. And doing it to spread, you know, a world-saving message, you know? Mm hmm Yeah, absolutely. And in 2006, then, there was the single and video Wild Energy, uh, which was also, like, this unique fantasy style. And she gets to do, I think this is really fun, Grand Theft Auto 4, you know, the way there's all the different radio stations. Mm-hmm. Ruslana's voice is the host of Vladivostok FM on Grand Theft Auto 4. You can play that game and listen to her voice. And her song Wild Dances is featured as one of the songs on that radio station. Yeah, she's just, just done so much stuff. It's incredible. Yeah. So in 2009, she was invited to attend the 6th Asia Song Festival in Seoul, Korea. And her act was made with great enthusiasm by the Asian people who actually didn't really know her until she was there performing. Um, so she was supposed to receive an award for contribution to that cultural exchange between Ukraine and Asia in music. But in the end, she actually won the main award of the festival. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah, she won Best Artist at the Asia Song Festival. So that's her music career. And she does in 2011, 2013, she's still like doing things up till 2017 to do with her music career. 2013, mm -hmm. she had this really interesting sounding project called, I don't know how to say it, E-Y and then F-O-R-I and then Y-A, i for ya maybe. And it's performance art that integrates old Slavic circle dances, liturgies and elements of classic pieces of Russian composers. So it's kind of flash mob style performances where she's the dance teacher and the audience is part of the performance not just watching it so you go along to watch this performance and then it's like no you're part of it and you have to get up and take part and oh god I'd fucking love it <laughs> mm. so 
even though she's doing all this work and kicking ass and taking all these awards, she's also involved in politics from 2004 onwards. So she's appointed Goodwill Ambassador of Ukraine by UNICEF and she combats trafficking in human beings. Um, she releases two video clips which aim to make potential victors more aware of the dangers of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And she performed at an anti-human trafficking event in Vienna, Austria the same year. And her song, Not For Sale, became the anthem of the anti-trafficking campaign. So again, using her yeah. platform and her audience to spread these really vital messages. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, love her. And she also came out in 2004 um, as actively supporting the democratic processes in Ukraine in um, an event called the Orange Revolution. Mm -hmm. And her song, Dance of the Wolves, was devoted as the anthem to the Orange Revolution. So I really wanted to watch, I don't know if you watched it, there's an, an, a documentary on Netflix about Ukraine's history. No, I haven't seen it, actually. Um, I should watch that. Yeah, I really wanted to, but COVID. Um, <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So this Orange Revolution followed a pattern of revolution that was developed in Yugoslavia to overthrow that government of Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, and it involves a series of protests and political events from November 2004 to January 2005. And the kind of catalyst for it was a runoff vote of the 2004 Ukrainian presidential election, which was claimed and I think is now accepted that it was marred and with massive corruption, voter intimidation and electoral fraud. November 21st of 2004, there was leading candidates for president and there was several global pieces of media that showed that the results were rigged in favor of one of the candidates Yanukovych, Viktor Yanukovych. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's terrible. Yeah, that kicked off nationwide protests. Like, was anything done about that in response to the protest? Yeah. Did it, did well, it achieve yeah, anything? Yeah, it's like the Orange Revolution. They're getting shit done. Um, they Love Basically, it. the results of that runoff were annulled and a revote was ordered by Ukraine's Supreme Court. Oh, wow. Awesome. And then that revote was, like, under such intense scrutiny by domestic and international observers that, yeah, it had to be free and fair and it was declared free and fair. The final results showed a clear victory for the other guy, Yushchenko, mm -hmm. and he received about 52% of the votes and declared the official winner and had his inauguration in 2005 in Kyiv. Love it. So as part of that orange revolution, so it didn't just change the outcome of that vote, it changed a lot. The Ukrainian constitution was changed to shift powers from the presidency to the parliament. So it changed the fucking constitution. That change was supported by communist and democratic supporters. And it came into effect in 2006. Mm -hmm. So these two men, President Yushchenko was in power when this constitutional amendment came about. But the prime minister then was Yanukovych, the original corrupt guy. And it ended up with Yanukovych then still having more power. Yeah. So there's just a lot of political unrest. Yeah. And then in 2010, the Constitutional Court of Ukraine overturned those amendments, considering them unconstitutional. So it's during this time, 2006, 2007, that Ruslana was a member of the Ukrainian parliament for the party Our Ukraine. Then in 2008, Western Ukraine was hit by a flood. And Ruslana set up the Coordinating and Relief Center Carpathians Flood, SOS, 2008. The aim of the center was to create a database of people in need, provide emergency humanitarian help, and collect and distribute donations both from the public and from other Ukrainian artists and sports people to support the victims of the flood. Is there anything this woman can't do? Right. I love her. Yeah, and then she came out in 2010 as outspoken, supporting the next presidential candidate. In 2012 is where we see her focusing more on the politics than her music. Um, she became involved in this thing called a campaign against judicial arbitrariness. Ruslana was one of the leading figures of a pro-EU protest known as Euromaiden, and in November 2013, that started lots of spontaneous protests in Kyiv 
And this was all in response to the Ukrainian government suspending preparations for signing an association agreement with the European Union. On the first day of the protest, she stayed on a central landmark in Kyiv virtually all night, up to 10 hours a night. And in an interv interview with the Daily Beast in the 11th of December 2013, she explained her role in opposition as charging this landmark with freedom-loving energy and insisting she hated politics and she denied supporting any single leader. So she spent 100 days and 100 nights on this landmark with cold winter, inspiring the crowds and giving speeches and singing the Ukrainian national anthem every hour, day after day, night after night. Oh my gosh. <laughs> she often wow. slept just a few hours on the floor of the trade union building. And she, she was like a symbol of the people, power and peace and freedom. And she, yeah, she, she just rocked it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and then on the 30th of November, the riot police wanted to clear that area and started being violent towards the sleeping activists. She rushed for help and managed to seek shelter with about 100 people in a nearby monastery. And during another night when the riot police advanced again, she did her utmost to de-escalate the situation. She talked to them from the stage and she gave protesters the courage to peacefully withstand more than 2,000 riot police who eventually retreated. Her commitment in the pro-European movement was featured on lots of international publications. American press regarded her as the true heroine of Ukraine. German magazines called her Kiev's Queen of the Night. And Spanish newspaper El Mundo compared her to Joan of Arc. Oh, wow, that's quite a comparison. Yeah, she even got compared to Katniss Everdeen, uh, the heroine in Hunger, <laughs> Hunger Games. <laughs> that's awesome. And it was all these events that led her to be named in the top 10 of the most influential women of 2013. January 2014, she starts meeting with key EU and US politicians asking for support for Ukraine. And these meetings resulted in a resolution of the EESC to support the Ukrainian civil society and its democratic rights. In the following months, she traveled everywhere, Europe and America, speaking to leading government officials, demanding international support, and in addition, she gave mass media to the various countries an authentic view of the events in Ukraine at the time. Her activism put herself in danger. She received numerous death threats on her phone. Her car was followed. She couldn't leave her house for several weeks because she was constantly observed. Oh, gosh. There was snipers aimed at her during this time she was on, on that maiden stage in Kiev. Oh, my God. And these threats basically have followed her around since that, that orange protest. And she also noted the presence of paid provocateurs who instigated fights in otherwise peaceful pro-EU protests. So a bit like mm -hmm. we're seeing coming out of Black Lives Matters protests. Yeah, and this kind of danger and violence is something that is so often, unfortunately, aimed at very visible political protesters and people mm -hmm. who people who speak out in that way against these powerful systems. And I think across the gender spectrum, but particularly for women. Yeah completely to keep speaking up and to keep doing all of that in the face of so much danger that's yeah wow love her and again it's just like <laughs> the awards are just rolling in basically um, for her as well yeah you know she won international woman of courage award which was awarded by michelle obama and the distinguished humanitarian leadership award mm -hmm. on the 24th of may 2014 the day before the presidential election in ukraine which also happened to be her birthday, she organised a global joint prayer which involved one million people in several countries, highlighting the unity of Ukrainians across the world and the global support for Ukraine. She herself read the prayer for Ukraine for peace and quiet and performed the Ukrainian national anthem in 12 mm. languages. Wow. With her project Wild Energy, she's also been an active campaigner for renewable energy the energy of the sun, the water and the wind and makes links between this as the energy of independence. Mm -hmm. The project has developed into a bigger meaning and she's been very involved in awareness around climate change as well. And in 2018, she was appointed as a global ambassador for renewable energy. So in this interview from the 25th of February, she just said, like, this is a war against civilization. And we're shocked because nobody prepared for this current circumstances. 
she's you know she said so many beautiful things about Kiev and just expressed heartbreak at the fact that it's destroyed she gave a military update on attacks the night before and that day and she said I'm stronger now because I am 24 hours online with my Facebook and I am a soldier now I use my voice 24 hours to inform you inform the Slavics around the world I'm strong enough and I use my voice to stop the war use your voice like me Look, it's very easy, but your voice, your statement can save us. Very dangerous for people like me because I am always trying to voice against Putin and propaganda. Wow. And that is everything I could find. And the scattered and not totally linear story of Ukrainian artist and creative and activist Ruslana. Amazing. That was, oh, that's so good. Oh, well done. Love that one. Yeah, I felt very inspired reading her story you know I just you know and the grace she had in that video to you know she's like like oh we we never imagined it would get this far but I really also identified looking at her story overall to be like she still has this grace on the world stage of not having any resentment that this has been coming for a long time and Mm -hmm. that like enough hasn't really been done to prevent this in my opinion yeah yeah absolutely Mm. yeah so how far back in history did you go Jess for your um for your story I kind of started out looking at some of the sort of general feminist history of Ukraine and kind of what um, things are like for women over there and what things have been like for women there sort of historically. Yeah, found some kind of interesting stuff, actually. So during the Soviet era, so prior to the independence of Ukraine in 1991, feminism was classified as a, quote, bourgeois ideology, according to one source. So it was believed to be a kind of specifically anti-Soviet ideology which is, you know, unsurprising, really. Yeah. That's often, unfortunately, often the way that feminism is portrayed as this thing for kind of wealthy, upper-class women who don't have anything better to do. Yes, even today it's like, oh, you know, you first world problems or... Right, exactly. What about women exactly. in these countries, you know? It's, it's, yeah, but I think it's fair to say, like, the feminist movement has been frowned upon by every type of government <laughs> that it yeah. rallied against. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I found some other kind of information around kind of general women's rights and equality and all those sorts of things. So women make up around 54% of the overall population of Ukraine and 47.4% of its labour force, according to the most recent statistic I could find. Hmm. Around 60% of Ukrainian women have higher education, so college level or above, but the unemployment rate for women is much higher than it is for men. Mm. So there's there's legal equality for men and women in labor laws, but in practice, as as in many places, including, you know, of course, here in the UK, industries that are dominated by women tend to have lower yeah. wages overall compared to industries that are um, dominated by men. There's been some reports of employers refusing to hire younger women because they think that they're going to become pregnant, which, again, we know we know is a problem everywhere. I mean, it's hugely a problem in the UK. It's a problem in the US. It's, you know, just, just because it le- it's illegal doesn't mean it doesn't happen because people have these unconscious biases, of course. At best. Yeah. So in 2019 Ukrainian parliamentary election, there were 87 women elected to parliament, which was a record for Ukraine and amounted to 20.52% of the total number of deputies. There was a change in the law in 2016. So prior to that, women were allowed to join the military, but they were limited to non-combat roles. So things like medics and cooks and accountants and all that sort of thing. But 2016, that changed and they were began to allow women to participate in combat roles in the military. Mm. I also found some interesting stuff on reproductive rights. So abortion is legal upon request up to the first 12 weeks of pregnancy and then up to 28 weeks on a a variety of grounds, which can include medical, social, personal grounds. This source says, for any reason with the approval of a commission of physicians. 
And the current president, uh, President Zelensky, has spoken out in favour of expansion of abortion rights as well. Ugh. Yeah. Is there anything that man can't do? <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of memes like, guys, prepare for all your wives to, like, leave you for him. And... <laughs> <laughs> He's, he seems like a really good guy. Like, he seems like genuinely a very sound guy. I, I, li- I like him most of everything I've seen. It's, like, very refreshing to see a politician that, on everything that I know about him so far, is on the right side of history, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I also briefly looked into LGBTQ rights because I was curious about that. Obviously, we know that in Russia there's so much um, mm. LGBTQ oppression So in Ukraine, consensual same-sex relationships are legal. There's pride events in the country and things. Same-sex marriage is constitutionally banned, sadly, and same-sex couples are not currently able to adopt, according to the most recent information that I could find. There's been some politicians who have tried to suppress the freedom of speech and freedom of assembly for LGBTQ people with these so-called anti-propaganda laws, Ugh. which we know is a, is a thing, again, in, in so many places. They haven't, they haven't succeeded, it seems. So there was a 2010 study which showed that 28% of the Ukrainians who were polled believed that LGBTQ individuals should be able to live freely. But then in 2017, there was another poll that that showed that 56% of Ukrainians believed that gay and bisexual people should enjoy equal rights, which was a a massive shift in public opinion in a very short space of time. Mm. And I read this one source that said that many LGBTQ Ukrainians think that really true equality is not very far away because things are progressing so quickly, but they are terrified for what will happen to their rights and what will happen to even their safety under a Russian invasion. Mm. So that's, yeah, another really scary thing about this whole nightmare that's happening right now over there is what that could do for those rights that have been so hard won. So that's some background and some kind of interesting information I found. And as far as the feminist movement, I learned about this. So one of the biggest feminist organisations in Europe at the time was founded in the 1920s in this area called Galicia, I think I'm pronouncing that right, which was a historical geographic region that spanned essentially what is now southeastern Poland and western Ukraine. Okay. It was called the Ukrainian Women's Union, and it was led by a woman called Milena Rudnitska, and she is the person that I want to talk about a little bit in this story, because she's kind of awesome. So Milena was born in 1892 and she was uh, an educator, a women's activist, a politician, a writer. She was considered to be one of the most influential voices in the kind of interwar period in the women's movement at that time. So her father was descended from the Ukrainian gentry and her mother was from a Galician Jewish family. Interestingly, both of her parents' families opposed their relationship and so they didn't marry for almost a decade because at that time a person couldn't marry before the age of 24 without parental consent. So Milena studied at, I think I'm pronouncing this right, Lviv University and she graduated with a law degree and then she worked as a notary. Her family spoke Polish at home. Her mother raised her children as Ukrainian nationals, but she never actually gained proficiency with Ukrainian as a language. Um, So during the First World War, the family lived in Vienna, and Milena studied at the University of Vienna at that time. And then she received a degree, and then she began to work on a doctoral programme, but she didn't finish that. So, of course, at this time, it's, you know, 1917, 1918, World War I is in full swing, And she began working as a journalist in 1918. And then the following year, she met a man called Pavlo Lysiak, uh, who was a lawyer and politician, who was also had also studied at Lviv and was also living in Austria. They got married and they had their only child, who was called Ivan, that year. And their home became this sort of this sort of hub, this sort of gathering place for leaders in the um, Ukrainian intellectual community who were living in Vienna at the time. Back in Galicia, the um, Polish-Ukrainian war was going on at this time and had resulted in a territorial transfer to the Polish state, which resulted in kind of policies that were oppressive to minority populations. And Milena supported the Ukrainian national movement, but she felt that women had been assigned inferior roles within that. So that was really when her focus on organising for women and involving women more in this process when that really sort of came to the fore and became a a significant part of her politics. So she returned to Lviv in 1920. She and her husband separated. And from there, she 
founded, she helped to found and then became one of the leading activists of this Ukrainian Women's Union. And along with some of the other members, some of the other women who were involved in the leadership of that, um, they um, they wrote journals, they organised conferences, they organised cooperatives. So this was very, very active at that time. And around the same time in 1921, she also started working in the teacher's seminary, which is essentially is a, is a teacher training school. But then in 1928, she stopped teaching. And that was when she decided to turn her focus kind of entirely to social and political activism and organising. So she joined the Ukrainian National Democratic Alliance and she was elected to serve in the Polish Sejm, which is the lower house of the parliament of Poland. Um, and she served there between 1928 and 1935. While she was there, she used her platform to bring attention to suppression by government authorities, kind of minority group suppression, and also to the Soviet regime's denial of the famine in Ukraine that went on between 1932 and 1933. So she's, she's doing a lot of stuff. There's a lot kind of going on. So in 1935, the same year that she finished her period as a representative in the same, she uh, was elected as president of the Women's Union. She served in that role for four years until 1939. And during that time, she published in lots of different kind of feminist journals, in publications, something called Woman Citizen, something called Ukrainian Women. She also edited the women's page of a daily newspaper called Action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as we've mentioned, she was a real advocate for her country and she was very critical of the Polish authorities that were kind of really suppressing Ukrainian culture at the time, including kind of schools, religious institutions and things. She served on various committees for education and for foreign affairs, and she was known for being very charismatic and giving these very compelling speeches. So in 1931, she was one of three delegates from Ukraine who presented a case to the League of Nations against the Polish officials. Uh, she was also invited to the House of Commons in Britain to speak on the same issue. And during the 1932-1933 famine, she was vice chair of the Public Rescue Committee and she organised meetings with politicians, with scientists, with educators, all designed to address this famine and provide relief for the people who were, who were suffering as a result. And as a result of all of this work, she was selected to bring the situation to the attention of the League of Nations. This woman had a very big platform, like by this time she was very active in a lot of different things. So in 1933, uh, 29th of September 1933, there was this meeting of 14 different countries in Geneva and Milena, along with other members of the Ukrainian delegation, presented the information they had about the famine and made this call for international assistance that was needed for their people as a result of that. And the League of Nations decided ultimately that the famine was an internal problem for the USSR which was not a member of the League of Nations, and essentially, therefore, that they weren't going to help. What? Yeah, they decided it was an, it was an internal issue, and so they were not going to step in. So Milena and the rest of the Ukrainian delegation, then they went to the International Committee of the Red Cross to essentially plead with them for help. So the Red Cross officials contacted Soviet officials trying to sort of get approval to organise this international aid that was needed but the head of the Soviet Red Crescent Society denied that there was any famine in Ukraine. Oh, that is some fucking North Korea shit. It's terrible. So, like, this is going on, all these people are starving and dying, and they're just saying it's not happening. Yeah, I'm not surprised, but it's disgusting. Yeah. So, December of that year, 1933, there was another international conference in Vienna. Milena went and spoke there essentially urging the international community to pressure the regime to admit that there was a crisis and to allow this aid that they so desperately needed. But the denial continued. Denial about the nature and the scope of this crisis. Mm. And in 1958, um, she would publish a book with a title that translates approximately to Fighting for the Truth About the Great Famine. She took the position that the famine was a result of organised pressure by the Kremlin to, quote, fracture Ukrainian peasants against collectivization to curb the rebellious Ukrainian people. Jesus. So more like less of a famine and more of a genocide, really. Yeah, that essentially, it seems like that was her stance. And based on the, yeah, just so much denial and suppression of aid and help. And it's horrific. I think we'd be shocked if we realised how much that happened in history. Yeah, absolutely. It's disgusting, you know. Yeah, definitely. So 
This is 1930s, 1933. That was also the year that Hitler came to power. Ugh, more problems. Almost immediately, the laws that were passed by his regime were restricting women's lives. So there were laws that barred women from employment in the civil service. Yeah. There were quotas to limit the number of women who could access higher education. Mm -hmm. Women were being refused admittance to the legal profession. So many like immediate changes in the law deliberately designed to suppress women. So Milena wrote this satirical article for a magazine called Women's Voice, which characterised the Nazi regime's view of women as monsters who had no purpose other than to cook, clean and bear children. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. The following year, she helped to organise the first Ukrainian Women's Congress. And then three years later, in 1937, she was elected as president of the World Union of Ukrainian Women. Oh my God, in the face of Nazism. So throughout all of this, the late 1930s, this whole sort of period leading up to the start of World War II, the Polish government were watching the members of this women's union very closely. They were arresting some of the members of the leadership. They were really trying to ban this organisation outright to just shut it down entirely. Yeah. So then 1939, and during the Soviet invasion of Poland that year, the regime annexed this Galicia area. So many national-oriented activists had to flee the area. And Milena moved at that point to Krakow, which was occupied by the Nazis at the time. But then later on, she moved to Berlin, where her son was studying. She she moved around a lot in this period. So she lived in Prague for a while. She went back to Berlin for a while. And then she was in Geneva for a, for a few years, directing something called the Ukrainian Relief Committee. Yeah, well, understandably as well, if she's constantly being watched and followed and her friends are being arrested, you know, like the moving around, you know, it might also be about like, finding employment opportunities but also to hide oh absolutely yeah Yeah, about safety definitely so in 1950 she went to new york city stayed there for eight years and then went back to europe moved to rome for a while finally settled in munich and it was during this sort of period that she wrote lots of her what would become her most well-known publications and she lived to the age of 83 She died in March 1976 in Munich, she was 83 at the time, and she was buried initially in the Ukrainian section of the Waldfriedhof Cemetery. But then in 1993, her remains were moved to uh, Levu and reburied there in the Lushavik Cemetery beside her other family members. Mm. And there was a book that came out in 1994, which was titled Milena Rudnitska and Ukrainian Feminism, The Art of the Possible, which was all about her massively influential role in this in this women's movement throughout much of the 20th century fuck yes yeah that's her life like what a badass some interesting things about the ukrainian women's union Mm. it was active from 1920 up to 1938 and this source says it did not focus on attainment of political agency for women So instead, the focus was really all about community initiative, modernising society, and particularly for the first few years, it was really all about establishing economic and cultural structures that would improve the life of all Ukrainians. Unlike many Western feminist organisations at the time, it was not primarily made up of people who were members of the elite. Hmm, wow. Yeah, this source said leadership of the group understood feminist principles, but they did not pursue a feminist agenda until they had increased their membership and initiated economic and social reforms to improve the lives of Ukrainian families. Oh, my God. More intersectional than most movements at the time. Jesus. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So most of the membership came from kind of the lower classes and the whole focus was on action and was on work and was on getting stuff done rather than this more theoretical yes. approach yeah one of the things that they did according to this source was that they sponsored these art cooperatives so people could create goods and then exhibit them and sell them so essentially fostering a, a market for their products and for the things that they were making ah really interesting approach you know and very as it says very different to a lot of the kind of western um feminism that was happening at the time really inspiring as well yeah. like i don't know there's something about the infusion of the creativity with activism again there that is also in Roslana's story that like it's very inspiring yeah Mm. they were criticized a lot as you can imagine according to this they were criticized a lot by catholic intellectuals um (laughs) liberals and radicals (laughs) oh my friends the catholic church they don't like much things i do it's okay (laughs) 
Ah. Yeah, but they, they had a lot of autonomy and they had a lot of support right up until the outbreak of World War II. So in May 1938, the Polish police arrested all of the leadership of all of the branches, which, you know, essentially was what killed its its operations in the Jesus end. Which is Christ. really sad because think what they could have done if they'd been able to keep going. But they but they did so much in those nineteen years or whatever it was is yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that's the really sad thing we are seeing about conflict is it doesn't just freeze progression and steps towards inclusivity a country is making, but it just I don't know, it just completely contracts people into being so frightened of the other and aggressive towards the other that like all the ugly things from society just come out to dance you know yeah absolutely yeah I was just reading about like when you gave some statistics about like women's rights in the Ukraine and LGBT rights I also looked up racism in the Ukraine Oh yeah, what did you find? And even, so it's a multi-ethnic country and there's been arguments, it's been a fringe issue in the past, but there's been a climb recently due to ultra-nationalist parties getting attention in recent years. Mm Mm-hmm, that sounds familiar. Yeah, the Human Rights Watch said that racism and xenophobia remain entrenched problems in Ukraine. Tolerance towards Jews, Russians and Romani have significantly declined since 2000. And prejudices are reflected in daily life against other groups in accessing goods and services. 2006 to 2028, so over two years, there was 184 attacks. 12 racially motivated murders took place. None recorded in 2009 for murders, but 40 incidents of of racial violence were reported. Oh my gosh. But basically what what they're saying here is that it's not really a decrease. That's it's basically the people who are attacked on racial grounds not reporting the incidents to the police anymore and police often Mm -hmm. um, failing to classify the attacks as racially motivated and just kind of writing them off. Yeah. A 2010 poll showed that 70% of Ukrainians estimate the country's attitude towards other ethnic minorities as conflict and tense. Oh god, it's really sad. And then I read about people with disabilities, you know, what happens to them in war times, you know. I found this letter from the 24th of February the European Disability Forum calling for parties to ensure the protection and safety of people with disabilities in Ukraine. They just say that in any situation of conflict, people with disabilities face disproportionate risk of abandonment, violence, death, and lack to access to safety. When with disabilities are at increased risk of sexual violence and children with disabilities are exposed to abuse and neglect. Crucial information on safety and evacuation is inaccessible or, you know, evacuation centres aren't accessible. And there's 2.7 million people with disabilities registered in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And they also say about people with disabilities living in institutions that they're already cut off from their communities and they further risk being abandoned or forgotten. Yeah. So, you know, I think as well, we're seeing a lot of racism in, in the media around people saying things like, these are people with blue eyes. They're not used to war, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, that is just inherent in, you know, Middle Eastern culture to be at war. Therefore, it's easier for them, like, which is just so many things wrong with that notion. Yeah. Some of the stuff that's been coming out in the press is just this. Yeah. The only way I can describe it is is just wildly racist in a way that just somehow people still seem to think is acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. You know, sometimes you see people on TV and they say something and you can see that look in their eyes where they're like, did I just fucking say that? You know, because it's live yeah, and it's maybe they've had 10 minutes to prep, you know, for whatever they're reporting on. And with this, it's just people like both the person interviewing them and them themselves are just like, yeah, that was a valid point. You know, it's just people aren't mm-hmm. even catching how fucked up it is, you know? Yeah. Um, Which I think just says a lot about white people bias, basically. Mm hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I don't know how to end this episode, Jess. Me neither. The world is on fire. Things are terrible. A lot of people are hurting and dying right now and it's awful. I don't know about you, but I just watch the news and I just feel so helpless. Mm. Yeah, there's been lots of people putting really good information out there about sort of ways that people can help and ways that people can, you know, get involved and and support people and things. So maybe we'll pop some links in 
you know, if there's things that people can do, then maybe we maybe we share some of those. What are your top three things to do to take care of yourself when you're feeling overwhelmed and helpless? See, I'm so bad at this. This is the oh. thing. Um, because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people saying, you know, like switch, switch off the news, stop reading stuff. You can't. But it feels, I don't know about you, for me, almost switching off from it feels irresponsible. Mm-hmm. Which I know isn't helpful and no isn't isn't helping anyone. But yeah, I'm very prone to bouts of, you know, hours and hours of just doom scrolling. And I need to get better at avoiding that. So what about you? Do you do you have any good tips for people who are feeling overwhelmed by it all? Um I think it's like I suppose I feel quite mentally resilient at the moment, so it's easy for me to say this, whereas I know other people might not be in that space, but mm-hmm. What helps me is remembering that, I don't know, my, my primary purpose is is I want to help other people and there's no way I can do that if I'm glued to my screen or if I'm mm-hmm. panicked or whatever. So it's just, you know, if I catch myself panicking or doom scrolling, just taking, like just switching off the doom scrolling and actually tune into what I'm feeling and just honor it and just have a breath and just you know comfort myself journal or talk aloud this is normal what you're feeling and gratitude does really help you know just coming back to well you know I am in this place where I have achieved this today you know the sun is shining this is happening and just taking in my surroundings, you know, I'll, I'll never forget, like, the morning the Brexit vote came through and I was living in Oxford, you know? Yeah. I just got up and went on my bike at, like, half seven in the morning on three hours sleep. And there was something about cycling around. And I'm like, oh, the buildings haven't fallen down. You know, the sun is still shining. Yeah. I still met the same people for coffee. The bins were still being taken away. You know, lovely service people were out and they were cleaning the streets. And there's something about just taking that moment to be like, okay, I am not the one who has the buildings falling on me right now. And from that space, being able to empathize and do the next right thing. And that might be donating money it might be sharing in a, a link in a sa- way that's safe for you to not get sucked into it again it might be going and having a discussion it might be you know it might be doing some service to your local food bank or a more local cause if that's all you can do volunteer at your soup kitchen to make a choice that makes you be the kind of person you hope is around if your buildings start falling around you yeah um, yeah that's really smart thank you Mm, and that can also just be even calling a friend who's struggling or yeah just when our buildings fall down we're going to need good people in the world so we better start practicing that now yeah absolutely Mm. so on that note (laughs) we will i guess we'll sign off but we'll be back with our regularly scheduled podcast in two weeks yes so with some content that we recorded a while ago podcast timeline will be as jumbled up as my timelines when I try to retell history uh but it's all good (laughs) so until next time we love you Ukraine and yeah love women yeah see you all next time bye bye